Hello everyone and welcome to part two of our textbook in Gender and Philosophy. The section of this chapter is called What is Sexism? And we're going to take a look at the writings from Kate Millett, Ann Cudd and Leslie Jones, Susan Fry, Susan Bark Bartley, and Marion Young. So starting off with Kate Millett, who was an American feminist activist, writer, filmmaker, teacher, and human rights advocate. This particular reading is from her book, Sexual Politics, which actually helped to fuel the second wave of feminism in the United States. Chapter two of this textbook demonstrates um, that sex is a status category with political implications, right? So um, a, she, we will later address the issue of whether or not sex is tied specifically to biology, but the idea is that regardless of whether or not sex is, a bi is tied to biological functions, it, the category itself functions to grant social status with significant political implications that she will go into great detail to discuss. So by politics here, she is talking about the power structure relationships, right, in general, not just government politics, but general power structures between groups where typically, right, one group controls another. And of course, the uh, political system or power structure that we are existing in is one of patriarchy, where, again, as a generalization, men typically, but primarily uh, white, able-bodied, heteronormative men, right, control women, and women have not only no recourse, right, which she will talk about and we'll discuss examples of, but also great incentives to not fight against that patriarchal structure and to help maintain the status quo. So I have a little activity here for you if you'd like to practice sort of diving into these readings on your own, right? So here there are eight different areas of sexism which Millet is going to go through. So if you'd like, you can follow these steps to practice before checking your own answers against the summaries that I've provided. So let's start off with the ideological component or dimension of sexism, right? This has to do with the um, use of that power structure, not just in general life, but also again in government structures to uphold either through the consent of their people or violence, the power which they currently hold, right? So the idea is that they have an existing power and they will either use popular opinion or physical violence typically both, right, especially in the, for in the component of patriarchy, but they will use those forces to maintain their power. So Millet looks at the way that consent, right, in this case is obtained through the socialization of both sexes, right, so again talking about the binary here, with regard to three primary elements, temperament, roles, and status. So what do we mean by temperament? Well, the idea here is that human beings have been socialized, right, to align themselves characteristically with one of the two binaries in the traditional sex categories, right? Either they were, they're socialized, right, raised, um, and put pressure on to conform to masculinity, or they're raised and pressured to conform to what we might traditionally understand as femininity. But the important point here is that traditional notions of masculinity and femininity, which we'll be exploring more in detail later throughout the quarter, both function to support male dominance, right? So it's not that traditional femininity is opposite from masculinity in the sense that it strives for its own power over men, right? It's seen as opposite purely in its characteristics, which when, as we saw with Simone de Beauvoir, when we associate masculinity with the norm, right, what is uh, typical, what is positive, what happens with its opposing force of femininity is that it is maintained as weakness, right, um, lesser than, inferior to. And so when we are stereotyped in our temperament, in our, in our behaviors, in our conceptions of ourself, in our characteristics, to one of these two binaries of sex, the idea then is that we will, those characteristics should correspond to quote-unquote traditional sex or gender roles, right? So the idea is that if you are feminine, you would fit most neatly into a feminine role in society, which as I'm sure we all know has historically and still today, right, there are groups that are advocating for the notion that women's only place is in the home, right? 
not as individual selves, but as mothers and spouses, right? And so the idea is that we've constructed not just legal roles that men and women have been placed in throughout history, which she'll talk about, but that these are actually very elaborate codes of conduct, which we can ascribe to each sex in terms of how they should speak, how they should dress, how they should move about in a certain space, how they should have a certain attitude towards certain things, right? All of these things fit into this notion of role. It's not just perhaps your occupation, but really every way in which you behave or act in the world. And then prescribed to these roles is of course status, right? So we're talking about social status as well as socioeconomic status, which she'll get into as well. But the idea here is that when we have an unequal power structure and then we place people within those roles, well then of course we're gonna have unequal statuses that are gonna be granted to each of them. So in a patriarchal system, right, females, those who are identified as being feminine are going to be given that lower status, again, in general. The biological component, right, is the idea that historically we perceive men or those who are born into male bodies as having a necessarily heavier, larger musculoskeletal structure, right? Which actually is, of course, if you know, not always the case, right? So men and women, uh, intersex individuals, we all have very different body types, right? There's not one sort of body type that happens to capture what it is to be a man more so than women, right? But we still sort of ascribe to these general stereotypes. And one of the points that Millet is going to make in this section is that she's going to talk about how this notion of physical strength is totally irrelevant to the political power relationships that we find ourselves in. Now, this is probably different than most of us have understood patriarchy in the past, right? We might think that, well, men have found themselves at the top of this power structure because they have these, you know, supposedly stronger physical or sexual characteristics, right? And here she's saying that that male supremacy actually doesn't even depend on their physical strength, but is actually going to depend more upon our psychological value systems, right? So the ideas that we are grown up with, not as much as the actual biological fact of the matter, right? And so she'll give us some examples of this down the line. So gender here is going to have a psychological or cultural, right, rather than biological connotation, right? It's perhaps why someone could um, have a very uh, perhaps strong physique as a man, but if they were to act in a way that might be considered traditionally feminine, we would then make presumptions about their identity that had more to do with their feminine aspects than their physical strength, right? And so the same could be said of women, right? If you were looking at a woman, someone who is born into a female body that is perhaps embodying um, traditional notions of petite size or a demure way of carrying themselves, but if that individual is perhaps very outspoken, right, very um, intelligent and uh, forceful in, in vocalizing their own opinions, right, I can think of AOC as someone who might fit this, this sort of characteristic, then they are immediately, right, denied <laughs> the sort of praise that traditional femininity has received in a patriarchal structure, right? They begin to be criticized, right, cut down, more so, again, because of those psychological, right, or um, characteristic temperament aspects more so than just their physique, right? So we can think of examples on both sides of this. Millet that concludes this section by noting that because of our so social circumstances, right, because men and women, males and females, have been socialized in these different ways, we actually have two entirely different cultures, right, and that their life experiences are thus completely different. Now, of course, this is an earlier form of feminism, right? So it's not gonna be as inclusive, but we can add on to this idea that perhaps, again, not all men, right, have the same culture, right? So if we're looking at it from a position of race, similarly, right, not all women are gonna be having the same experiences. 
Again, going outside the binary, we can look at how intersex, trans, right, other members of the LGBT community might also have different quote unquote cultural experiences, right, because of their unique experiences in the world, right? But the idea is that this comes from very early conditioning, right? It starts not just from our parents and peers, but it can begin, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, even from the perspective of the doctors who are assigning biological sex. All right, so the third category or dimension of sexism here is the sociological element, right? Where patriarchy's chief institution, as she says, is the family. And so we can see this as tied to um, different notions of feminism, again, um, in my earlier PowerPoint between radical Marxist and liberal feminism, right? So the idea here is that the primary mechanism of enforcing the patriarchy is first and foremost the family, right? And then the idea is that that then bleeds out into society and then larger to the state, right? And the idea here is that the fate of one of these things, right, society or state or family, will depend heavily on the functioning of the other two, right? So the idea is that people make arguments that we need to maintain a traditional notion of family because if we don't, that will somehow cause not just a disintegration within that family unit, but then as a result, disintegration in society and the state, and vice versa, right? Societies and states are seen as helping to protect those family units, and so if those societies or states were to fall apart or to become chaotic, so too then would the family, right? So these are all seen as very interconnected, and it's why we see such a heavy reflection of what we have known as the nuclear family, right? One, one man, one woman married to each other, heteronormative, at least one child, right? So that sort of nuclear family is not only something that doesn't exist in most cases, right? Even if you happen to have heterosexual parents, right? We know that in many cases, those parents are not, for a number of different reasons, capable of maintaining uh, the same household, right? Maintaining that marriage, even maintaining that relationship with their child for whatever reason, right? So you could have been raised by someone else, right? Another family member, perhaps you were adopted, right? There are all these different scenarios that we can imagine. But we still see this sort of presumption in society and state that that is what a family is and what a family should look like. Right? And so these uh, states, whether they're religious or secular, right, non-religious, tend to presume not only that those families are the norm, but thus then that the father is the head of that household, right? And so this idea is then supported by societies and states specifically, not just with um, legal parameters, but also with financial incentives, right? So this goes back to the origins of the, the gender gap, right? Why men have historically made more, women, uh, more money than women. The uh, presumption was that, well, the husband needs to support his family. For some reason, that same presumption did not get extended to women. Right? And so the status of women within the marriage in every patriarchy has always been grim. Right, Not only have they not had the same, if any, legal protections, they have not been granted the right to control their own property or finances that would empower them to leave a situation if it were harmful to them or their children. Right, And so the idea here is that the chief contribution of the family is the socialization of the young within the confines of the patriarchal family, right? So the idea is that this process is seen as perpetuating itself, right? We raise individuals within that system under that norm, even if it's not in fact their own reality, and thus put pressure on them as they get older and also incentives for them to repeat that supposedly idyllic family structure, right? We're seeing a lot of this come up now as uh, more and more young people are are deciding, you know, for a number of reasons not to have children or to not get married. Um, we're seeing a lot of pushback on this. We're seeing uh, s states and governments try to give financial incentives for people to have kids, despite the fact or the issues of overpopulation, right? And so we have, again, this idea that there's some sort of vested interest that will continue um, in the perpetuation of that status quo. And again, what that status quo has historically been is that men have owned the property and women generally don't own much at all. 
Patriarchy also decrees that the status of both the mother and the child are seen as being dependent upon the male, right? When again, even though we have probably seen and experienced many counterexamples to that, the patriarchal society in which we've been socialized has so engendered that idea into our minds that we still sort of assume it as the norm. This le leads into the fourth category of sexism in its relation to class. Here we're talking about socioeconomic status as well as just the ways in which we might hold someone up in uh, esteem, whether it be in relation to an authority figure or not. So we can talk about it from the financial position, right, as well as an epistemic position. So the idea here is that her conception of sexism as it relates to class is deeply connected to our traditional notions in the West of love and romance. Now she does note that these have been different in the West as they have been traditionally in the East, right? So the idea here is that if, you know, individuals love each other, right, then they will form this nuclear family. But she wants to point out that if men truly loved women, right, in the ways in which romance has uh, given us many different perspectives of love, whichever sense of love that might be, even as a protector, right, that they would not allow the two-tier caste system, as it were, right, where men are predominantly given more status and power than women, they would not allow that system to continue. Moreover, right, she says the emphasis on or obsession with romance in the West serves to conceal the patriarchal nature of those very societies. And what she means here is that our very conceptions of romance and the way they are portrayed tends to put the problematic aspects of patriarchies in a more positive light. So I think the most obvious examples of this would come from, you know, the the issues with the many Disney princess stories, right? So, I mean, if we take the most basic example, right, of uh, Sleeping Beauty, right, or Snow White, the idea is that it is romantic for a stranger to come and kiss or make physical or sexual contact with an unconscious woman, right? And that somehow leads to love and romance, right? That's just to name one, if not a couple of examples, right? But we see many instances of this um, or where, you know, a woman declines interest in a man, yet he continues to persist, perhaps even engaging in stalker-like behavior, right? If not instances of sexual harassment, and that too is then over time, right, we're told that that will actually bloom into romance and genuine love, right? So she says that romance in a sense is a double-edged sword, right? Because again, not only does it presume that there is a shared love or compassion between the two partners, but that romance depends upon right, women fitting a particular role and what she thinks of in this case as a caricature of what a virtuous woman is, right? So a good woman, right, one who fits traditional notions of masculinity is seen as worthy of romance as opposed to a quote unquote bad woman, right, who would be acting in a way that was contrary to traditional notions of femininity. So someone who was not acting weak, someone who was not acting demure, right? Someone who was not being especially emotional, right? Or reliant upon a man. Those would be non-traditionally feminine characteristics. And thus we think that it's her fault, right? If no one loves her, right? Or that she might not be deserving of that love, right? Because of those very characteristics. Right, so in this way, she says, impossible virtues, right, things that um, we aren't even able to fully embody in the real world are often attributed to women, right, again, creating a sort of false norm that we're all supposed to live up to. Right, so continuing this idea, right, is that this notion of romantic love has served as a means of emotional manipulation, right? So the idea here is that women who are conditioned to be quote unquote good, is it is only if they are, if they love their partner and that they are ideologically pardoned for sexual activity, right? So here we have a connection between romantic conceptions of love, what it means to be a good woman, and what is seen as permissible sexual actions engaged upon by men and women, right? So this goes to a very clear double standard that we have, right? So if 
unmarried men and women engage in sexual acts together, even if consensually, right? We often are very familiar with the fact that the woman will be most likely labeled a slut or a whore or any number of, you know, quote unquote, bad things. While the man, if not completely ignored in his participation in that activity, it might actually be celebrated, right? As someone who, you know, is this uh, Lothario who is capable of, you know, gaining the attraction of many women, right? So completely opposite reactions for the same types of activity, right? And so indeed some women may only have been able, she says, to let go sexually or lose their inhibitions in what we term a positive, right, traditional romantic situation, right? So the idea is that there's pressure on women, right, to confine themselves or to conceal their quote-unquote virtue in this way and to reserve it for only the right circumstances. Now, interestingly enough, right, social dimensions and developments have altered this sort of stereotype, even though we still see that sort of, uh, you know, double standard applied to men's and women's sexual activity, there's a flip side to this now where because of the sort of, um, uh, you know, greater social acceptance of maybe casual sex, right, uh, especially as we see the uh, proliferation of dating apps and things like this, we see that now, as, you know, if we assume everyone is having sex outside of marriage, then there seems to be this side of men's entitlement to sexual activity from women, regardless of whether they're in love or not, right? So, you know, on the one hand, the idea is that, you know, a woman should save themselves for someone that they're truly in love with. But then that other expectation is that, you know, if a man bothers to, you know, be a gentleman or take them out to dinner, right, that that somehow makes them entitled to sexual pleasure right, that the woman is supposed to give them, right? So again, we see these double-edged standards. We also see, even though the sexual practices have changed in our society, that there is still this sort of uh, different sort of expectation on what women are and aren't supposed to do, uh, given men's expectations. And it's really interesting, you know, as we see this in terms of what women actually find themselves Uh, in a position to say no to, right? So another component of this is the idea that women have been so socialized to feel responsible for the emotional and psychological well-being of others that they're made to feel bad if they want to say no, right? So sometimes they might consent not because they want to have sexual acts with that person, but because they feel obligated to or they are they're afraid of the ramifications of saying no, right? And I know that probably every woman can think of at least one experience where they've engaged in some sort of intimate action where they maybe f- changed their mind at some point through or never wanted to to begin with, but they sort of outweighed their own autonomy with the fear right, of what others would think of them. Okay, and so this leads into the economic and educational aspects of sexism, where she talks about the patriarchal government working very efficiently, right, due to the economic hold it wields over its female subjects, right? So this is, an, you know, another component of how this power structure maintains its status quo. So in traditional patriarchies, until very recently in most countries, women were quite literally considered non-persons, right? Meaning that they did not have any legal standing and they could neither own property nor earn a living, right? So again, this only changed very recently. If you wanna look at it in the West, it wasn't until um, the 1970s that, uh, or 80s, it might've been even later in the 80s when a woman could open a credit card without having a male cosigner when a woman could get a loan without having a male cosigner, right? So the idea is that these things are not as far back in our history as we would like to believe, right? And that's not to say that women didn't work, right? The idea was that women have always worked, right? Either in slavery or in the domestic sphere, doing the most strenuous and routine tasks, but that that labor has never ever been economically rewarded or to bring it up to the forefront, has not been equally rewarded economically speaking. 
there are other relations to this, right? As um, of course we might think that, well, maybe women haven't had equal pay or the same type of job opportunities because they haven't had the accompanying educational experience, right, or expertise. And so we can look about at how these two things are connected. Women, of course, have experienced great forced distance from areas of what we might consider um, the hard sciences or what Millet calls high technology. So large scale building construction, the development computers, right? NASA um, missions and things like this, right? So that distance between women, women's uh, work and those fields is great, right? In that those fields have been controlled, right? By the very people who already have political power. Right? And then even when women have participated in those fields, right? So we can, perhaps you've seen uh, some of the recent films on this subject, right? But even when they have participated in these, they never get any credit for their work, right? They're looked over historically um, and not even acknowledged. So a perfect example of this is in uh, Hidden Figures, right? Where we have actually the first computers were not machinery, right, in the, in the sense that we think of computers today. I mean, there were mechanical components, right? There was hardware, but the actual software, right, where we think of most of the programming going into, the very first computer software was actually female, right? So these were women whose job it was to manipulate the data and to engage in um, feeding the hardware and, you know, coordinating everything and uh, analyzing the outputs, right? So the first computers were actually female, but again, we associate, right, computer programming, computer technology, primarily with the male dominance of other technology fields, right? And so other, you know, perhaps reasons for why these sorts of um, male-dominated disciplines persist is that even though we do have more women entering into these fields, it could be argued that, again, as we're socialized as women, we're not as encouraged to pursue those types of disciplines, right? We might be encouraged to concentrate on what are considered the more inferior spheres of culture, right, through things like studying the humanities, right? So this is the idea that um, you know, we see more women who are encouraged to go into maybe the social sciences, right, liberal arts, humanities, more so than men, but even though we might see more women in those fields, achievement still tends to be reserved largely for the males in that area, right? So, um, again, right, we might see many women in the positions of teachers, Right, but those who are lauded as the experts, right, the sort of, uh, they often use the quote, founding fathers, right, of those disciplines, right, those are still reserved for men. The next part of this is uh, the use of force in maintaining um, and asserting sexism, right? So patriarchies have institutionalized force against women through their legal systems. For example, there have been strict patriarchal implementations which prohibit uh, against illegitimacy, so right in this case the illegitimate um, uh, procreation of an offspring, right, meaning that that has occurred outside of the institution of marriage, um, or the notion of sexual autonomy at all, right, a woman being able to make her own decisions about the sexual acts that she engages in. And the punishment for this, not for everyone involved, but usually solely for the women, has been death. Right, so um, a contemporary example of this still being the case is uh, in Saudi Arabia, where uh, if a case of adultery has been found out, right, so if someone has engaged in sexual acts with someone while one or more of those parties were married to someone else, then only the woman ha is stoned to death, right? Men are not stoned to the death for these activities. I think the only account of men being stoned to death is if they are found to have engaged in homosexual behavior. But men are not punished in these cases unless they are seen as having thieved, right, or stolen the property, meaning the woman, from another man, right? So the man would only be punished if the woman were married to someone else. But the woman is punished in all cases no matter what. Other aspects of death as being a use of force in patriarchal systems 
it has to do with the deprivation of allowing women control over their bodies, right? So when we say make safe abortions illegal, what we are doing is essentially condemning those women who seek to have an abortion, right? A higher likelihood of their own fatality. Right. And so the idea here is that when you make something illegal, that is not necessarily going to stop those actions from happening. Right. So these are the same arguments used in favor of legalizing, um, you know, uh, drugs and things like this. Prostitution is that, again, these things are going to continue to happen. So why not legalize them so that we can regulate them and make them safe? Right. But the idea is when you simply make it illegal, all you're doing is ensuring that women who are in need of having an abortion will have to seek that assistance either by their own means, right, or through some, um, you know, black market or uh, unsafe sort of experience, right, which will, of course, increase the likelihood that that will happen. Um, it, it will happen in an unhealthy and unsafe way for both parties. So the reaction to the violence against women in the patriarchies is, of course, often ambivalent, right? So people don't seem to be nearly as concerned about what happens to women as they are in these cases about how it affects the larger system or in the case of abortion how it affects the offspring right so women's status is considered secondary to the other supposedly interested parties right and this could also be you know discussed in relation to pornography right in that it too has utilized elements of force, right, especially in its history, where, you know, women were sort of roped into these industries or misled or um, perhaps uh, manipulated to enter into these industries, which are not necessarily targeting a female demographic, right? They're made for men, right, to be consumed by men. Okay, so what are the historical relationships, right, between myths and religions and sexism, right? So what she's talking about here is how anthropology as well as religious and liter literary myth have sort of reinforced or at least made explicit these sort of patriarchal convictions about women, right? So the idea is that the women, the image of women as we know it is an image created by men and fashioned to suit their needs. This has to do with the fact that just historically speaking, we don't have as many narratives from female authors, right? So the idea is that our understanding of history has come almost solely from the perspective of very privileged men. Right. And so what she claims then is that these needs, right, the need to portray women in this way springs from a fear of the otherness of women. Right. So the idea here is that othering, again, as we tie it back to what Simone de Beauvoir was talking about, is the idea of portraying women as outside of the norm. Right. Second class citizens. Right. Outside of the norm. Not those whom are worthy or deserving of our consideration, right, our empathy, our protection, and things like that. And she says that othering women in this way is necessary because then that otherness can be used as a rationale for men to justify the inferior status of women. Again, this might remind us of some of the issues brought up uh, in week one, specifically by Mary Wollstonecraft, right? So the idea that, you know, we, we put women in a position where they're uneducated, and then we criticize them for not being as smart as men, right? We're creating this sort of vicious cycle. We can also, uh, that otherness has also been used to explain the oppression, right, that those women have received in their lives. Many men often claiming that women want to be in that position, right? That it's actually better for them to be oppressed in those ways. So what she claims is that a constant in every patriarchy is the feeling that women, particularly their sexual functions, are impure, right? So this othering is often tied, she says, to presumptions about the female body and the fact that the elements of the female body which supposedly separate females from males, right, having to do primarily with um, menstruation, are considered unclean, impure, right? And uh, this has other sorts of religious connotations in the sense that, um, because a woman's menstruation is tied to the ability to give birth, 
right, in, in most cases, then that that is actually tied to a great spiritual power which men are then afraid of, right? And so patriarchal myth and religions tend to blame women for all the things that go wrong in the world rather than placing the blame at the feet of the men who are, of course, in control. And so should things go wrong, right, we might think that they should be the ones taking responsibility for it. Okay, and then um, the last component of this, I believe, yes, the last component here is the psychological element of sexism, where women are conditioned to despise both themselves and each other. And I think this is probably the element of sexism that we might be aware of most often in our everyday lives, right? So I'm thinking back to high school right, and just being young, but even in adulthood, right, you'll often see that when there is any sort of competition, either amongst women or uh, between women for the sake of men, that women end up placing a lot more hostility towards one another and even themselves than they are likely to produce against any men that they happen to be competing with. So the idea here is that just like any minority group, right, in terms of status, women not only experience group self-hatred, right, a lot of women will claim to hate other women, but also a sort of hatred and rejection of themselves, right? So she describes this as a contempt for both herself and her fellows, the result of that continual, however subtle, reiteration of her inferiority, which she ex eventually accepts as fact. And this has been well documented um, as was pointed out with, um, oh, forgive me, uh, as was pointed out with um, uh, Hood at the beginning of the, of the week, of week one, where there's this notion of imposter syndrome, right, or stereotype threat, where we are aware of stereotypes about certain groups in which we participate, but that we have found, even if they aren't true, because we have accepted it as a stereotype, we will actually act in correlation with it. So the best example I can think of is this, of this is studies that they have done with, um, uh, I think it was fifth graders, right? So this is typically around the time when uh, boys and girls start to become exceptionally aware of the stereotypes about gender and specifically the stereotype that boys are better at math than girls are. So in these studies, um, the two groups of, of young boys and young girls are given a math test, right, not discussing the stereotypes at all. And the results found that the girls are likely to perform higher, right, on those math tests. Then they give the same sort of test to that group, perhaps with different variables, but they give the same test to that group again after they've discussed the stereotype that boys are better at math than girls. And what happens then is that the boys end up scoring higher than the girls. So how are these results explained? Well, it's not that all of a sudden the boys got better at math. What actually is the case is that the girls who had previously performed better have so internalized and believed the stereotype that they are bad at math that they actually hinder their own performance and perform worse as a result of their lack of confidence in themselves, right? Similar studies have been done on uh, physical strength, right? Perhaps you uh, watched some of the media on, you know, hashtag like a girl, right? So you ask young kids to do something like a girl and they just run or throw or do whatever, you know, putting as much effort into it as they can. But when you ask older people to, you know, run like a girl or throw like a girl, they are like overly performative in, you know, acting weak, acting sort of silly, not having any strength, right? So the idea is that the adults are actually subconsciously holding themselves back in their physical performance based on the stereotype that they've accepted. So most women, she says, have found the situation too hard to bear in which case most women are then become in denial about the importance, right, of their own equality and so maintain that self-hatred, that self-rejection or um, hatred of the group as part of a mechanism of self-preservation, right? So the idea is that women will entertain, please, 
gratify, satisfy, and flatter men with their sexuality, right, even though those very activities often are rooted in a, an, a belief that they are less worthy than the men that they are supposedly serving. And the higher levels of status, right, then are typically given or permitted by those in control, right, so usually for their own entertainment. So the idea is that if a woman who feels you know, any sort of low self-esteem, if she engages in sexual acts which please men in high power, the sexual acts will not make her feel better, but the men's rewarding of her behavior, right, will make it feel like it was worthwhile. And the idea is that if a woman were to deny men those same sexual acts, right, then their own low levels of self-confidence would only be reinforced, right? So it would be even harder for them to say no, right? And to deny them this. So the idea is that they are not as rewarded for physical strength, courage, or serious intelligence, right? Quite the contrary. We find that women who, right, go against these ideas of traditional femininity, again, if the women happen to be strong, happen to be courageous, and happen to be intelligent, they are not only, again, ignored, right, or not praised, they are usually quite heavily punished or reprimanded socially for those behaviors.